All right, today, special guest, Lou Eckes from uh, Tropic Marin. He's the head of North American Tropic Marin. Uh, he's going to come share all of his knowledge with us today. Uh, not, maybe so, not all of it, like okay. some. Some portion of it. <laughs> yes. Uh, and uh, today, what we're going to talk about is the 10 things that Lou wishes more hobbyists could embrace as truth. Okay, these are some of the things, too, that I wish, like, just stop talking about it because it is true. And if we do that, we can move forward, right? Okay, this one, I'm going to tell you right now, I violate this all the time, even though I know it's true. Okay, even though I know, uh, it's, it's just, like, knee-jerk just try to do this. Okay, but his number one was make changes slowly, even when going from bad to good. Explain. Yeah, it's a super important principle. Um, the animals that we're keeping in our reef tanks are animals that live their life by osmosis and diffusion. Whatever's outside of them, they're equalizing in some way with what's ever inside them. And we can get into like the chemistry of the osmology of that and everything, but forget all of that. The important thing to understand about it is that they're exchanging stuff with their environment 24 seven. So if you notice something out of whack with your parameters and you change that too quickly, they're immediately changing what's inside of them to equalize with that. So let me give you an example. Um, I get a lot of calls about, we'll talk about this later, but I get a lot of calls about salinity problems, right? You, my salinity tester was, was off or whatever. You notice that your, your, your water in your aquarium is really super low in salinity or really super high. Let's take really super low as the example. Um, that animal, those polyps, are equalized with that low salinity inside them. Now you realize, oh crap, my salinity is low and you fix the salinity, you're back up to where you should be. Now all of a sudden, the surrounding water around that polyp is higher salinity than what's inside the polyp. So what happens? Well, the polyp is gonna try to equalize that. So water is gonna rush out of the polyp and that dries the polyp out. And trust me, that's not good for the polyp. Mm -hmm. So when you're making these changes, even from bad to good, you want to go slowly and let those polyps accommodate to those changes. Okay. So I'd never thought about it from the osmosis perspective. So that's cool. Uh, it's true that uh, the water on one side of the coral will eventually be similar to the water on the inside of the coral, except for some pumping action. Yeah. Essentially, yeah. though. But also it applies to all kinds of things. It applies to like lights, right? Yeah, yeah. If you turn your lights on, you find out your par, you know, was actually a hundred when it's supposed to be 300. You go correct that, expect bad news. Yeah. Right? You should find a way to slowly ramp it up. Uh, it, nutrients too. Like yeah. I have super, super high nutrients uh, or super, super low. And then I just like go try to like willy nilly correct it from zero to 20 or from 200 to zero. Yeah, I know I know so many people that they notice their phosphate levels are up and they start running, you know, GFO like massive amounts to get those phosphates down. And those polyps are, are freaking out because things are changing so quickly that they can, they're really good at accommodating. Corals are much tougher than we originally thought they were. They're, they're way tough, but it takes them time to make those accommodations. It goes slowly. A friend of mine once said, uh, if it took you uh, six months to create this problem, uh, it might take you six months to get out of it. Now, yeah, yeah. I can't tolerate six months, but I can understand why it should take me one or two and I shouldn't go correct it immediately. Yeah, exactly. It's also true, by the way, when you're starting a new process like carbon dosing or you're changing your method of calcium and alkalinity addition or whatever, don't just flip a switch one night and fix it and change it. Go slowly, have a little gradual change, wean off of one and wean on to the other so that those polyps get a chance to accommodate to whatever that new thing is that's happening. Okay, so there is a caveat to that and it's the difference between like kind of bad and like poison. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. Uh, and the analogy I use is one day I woke up and 10 gallons of kelp washer flooded my tank and the pH was off the hook and it looked like milk and uh, everything was going to die. Yeah. I searched the Internet and luckily found immediately the goal was to get it down as fast as possible at dumping vinegar into the tank. Oof. Right. OK. But like, you know what, man? The tank was like 11 ish uh, 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 pH, man. Everything yeah. was going to die. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I dumped the vinegar in there. That's going to cause some other problems. But you know what happened? 
pH went down. The only thing I lost in the whole thing was the Xenia, which I was actually very happy to lose. <laughs> Maybe that's a solution to uh, overtaking Xenia. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Actually, you know what? It all wiped out, but the little shreds of it stayed back and yeah, all came back. Yeah. Uh, and I lost a couple craps. But well, that was it. Yeah. You know, because I acted wow, fast to, to poison, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it was like, it was toxic. So the, it was funny because actually I shared that experience, you know, on the forums. And then I got lambasted about like, well, you're supposed to make slow changes and slow changes. And I'm like, yeah, I totally agree. Except for not when you got poison, solve poison now. Right? You know, there's a, there's a good kind of uh, lesson to be learned from that, which is that there's very little in what we do that is 100%. Mm. You know, like, like there's an exception to almost every rule that we come up with. And um, it's part of the problem because you know, like the average hobbyist, we're not, I, I consider myself an average hobbyist because that's what I was before I get into this. You know, it's like, we don't know the specifics of the chemistry of it. We're not, we're not drilled that down deep into things. And so we try to find these rules that we can apply 100% of the time. The biggest thing, the number one rule for me, and it kind of relates to this is, you got to learn the language of your tank and you got to learn to listen to your tank because it, your tank's going to tell you what you need to do if you're doing something right or you're doing something wrong. And if you learn that language that your tank is talking to you, is speaking to you, and you learn to, to understand it, you'll know when the exceptions are. And something like that happens, you know that's an exception. I got to fix it. Okay, so I'm going to give you an exception, <laughs> right? Uh, and this is one of the things like solving between like GFO mm -hmm. or solving with like water changes, mm -hmm. right? I got to tell you, I, I buy into the slow change thing all the way, right? But many, many times in my life have I done a like 100% water change. Oh, yeah. I've drained that thing down to the point the fish uh -huh. are like flopping, man, uh, and then filled the thing back up. Never once have I seen a negative response to that. In tanks where I know full well, like I can't even test nitrate. I mm -hmm. can't dilute the test enough because mm -hmm. uh, it was too fun of a summer and I just yeah. didn't do my water changes or food got in there or whatever, yeah. right? Okay. One of the reasons I think that that works better than other things is because you're kind of correcting a lot of good things all at once, right? Because there's a lot of things that you probably have no idea you screwed up on and you're correcting them all at once. Yeah. Now, I will tell you, I don't do that that often anymore. Uh, what I'll do now is if I have a suspicion that something's in bad in my tank, I will do a 30% water change or something like that. And then if things look way better after that, it's time to do three more of mm -hmm. those 30% water changes. And you can decide how far you want to spread them out. But like something's in here that is bad. It yeah. needs to get out. Uh, yeah, or there is some correction that you're making. The nice thing about water changes is that you're kind of resetting the system when you do that. And sometimes you don't even know what the thing is. Like, mm -hmm. we don't know everything there is to know about this. And so sometimes when you're doing that water change, you're resetting something that you didn't even test for, you didn't even realize was happening or whatever. Maybe it's something that's in there, maybe it's something that's not in there or whatever. But when you're doing that water change, you're using a good quality salt, you're, you're resetting that system back to kind of square one. So while I buy into that, I will also state though, like let's say some parameters off. You know, 30% water change is only gonna fix it 30%. 70% of this problem is still here. Yeah, that's on my right? list too. Okay, yeah. <laughs> We're gonna talk about that. So yeah, I mean, like it would have to be grossly wrong. But in any case, then whatever I'm doing with that water change is good. I don't drain them anymore. Uh, <laughs> but like, I just never saw a, a negative response to that. But definitely, if you go have sky high phosphate and you go use a ton of GFO and strip it down to zero, yeah. be prepared. There's going to be a negative result. Yeah, I want to. I want to kind of circle back on that point just to kind of finish it up, which is that the number of times that you shouldn't be doing the slow change is really limited. Like something's got to be massively amiss for you to not be doing the slow change. Agreed. It happens, but it doesn't happen very often. Okay, so this one's interesting. Uh, uh, people call synthetic salt sea salt all the time and synthetic salts. So you're saying there's no such thing as synthetic salt. All uh, sodium chloride comes from the ocean. All, exclamation point, exclamation point, exclamation point. Yeah, six or seven of them. Uh, it's time to talk about grade and refinement. Yeah. Explain. Well, I hear this a lot from people. You know, oh, I use 
this salt or that salt that has, you know, it's, it's better because it has evaporated seawater and it's got other stuff in it, whatever. The important thing to understand is that all sodium chloride comes from the ocean. If you're in a mine and you're digging up sodium chloride in a mine, that mine was located under a primordial sea. And that's where it comes from. Sodium chloride is formed in the ocean. I, 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 I may be wrong about this, but I think it has to do with volcanic activity. Um, it's formed in the ocean. It's where it comes from. If you have, if you're holding sodium chloride in your hand on this earth, it came from the ocean. The important thing is not, did the sodium chloride come from evaporated seawater or from a mine? Because they both have contaminants in them. They both have stuff in it you don't want. What's important is, what did I do to that sodium chloride once I got it in my hand? How much did I refine it? Mm -hmm. When you refine sodium chloride, you use steam and it costs money. It's expensive to create that steam and pressure to, um, to refine the sodium chloride. So more refined sodium chlorides and, and what the refinement process is, is getting rid of things that are not sodium chloride, leaving sodium chloride. The more refined it is, the more expensive it's gonna be because it costs money to refine it. Mm -hmm. So if you just dig it up and, and you know, it's salt, you're gonna throw on your, uh, I live in the Northeast, so we get ice. You throw you know, on your driveway. Um, that doesn't matter what's in that. And, and it's gonna melt the ice, right? But it's got a lot of junk in it. Mm -hmm. And so if you wanna refine it and get that junk out of there, you're gonna spend money doing it. And if I'm gonna buy a high grade sodium chloride, a much refined sodium chloride to make my products, it's gonna cost more. It definitely is. I can tell you from behind the scenes, I've talked to uh, not just you, but many, uh, many other people that make the salts. And the reality is, is it's gonna kind of come down to where you got that sodium chloride, because isn't it like 85% of what's in that bucket or yeah, something? Yeah, it's, it's, it's uh, about 80%, I think. Okay, 80% of what's in the bucket. Okay, so that sodium chloride. Uh, 70%. Maybe. I, I would say that it comes from three general sources. Mined out of the ground. Yeah. Uh, and then uh, when you mine it out of the ground, the inexpensive salts are basically looking for veins that don't require that much uh, mm -hmm. uh, processing and like just kind of getting lucky. And, and to the fact when I've talked to them, they're like literally go to the salt mines and say, hey, I can't afford to actually have this thing purified. Uh, tell me which veins are like, well, vein number seven, you know, generally meets the specs that you're looking for. Not always, yeah, yeah, you know, and so they're always having to test, you know, to find out, you know, did you hit a bad pocket or something, you know? Okay, the same thing outdoors is, uh, you know, like a byproduct of desalination plants. Mm -hmm. So you think that you're like going and pulling out sodium chloride uh, out of the sea, like that's really, really expensive, you know, to do that. So you're buying it as a byproduct of some other product, right? You know, often desalination. Uh, so, uh, I mean, some of those salts I've heard that you can find like, you know, you used to be able to find like feathers and stuff in it because it's happening outside. Yeah. I don't know about that. I mean, I, I think that all salt companies use salts that are refined to some point mm -hmm. and, and they're going to get cleaned up. The, the really bad stuff, feathers and whatever is in there, that stuff's going to get taken out. I'm, I'm not so sure I buy that. I believe it that much, but, um, it, it, I've seen, I've literally seen it here where we mix it up yeah. and some of them are yellow, man, yellow. Like, uh, it looks like salt that has been sitting in somebody's tank for forever yeah. to the point that I couldn't believe it. And it's definitely coming from the quality of that salt. Yeah, and the sodium chloride is a big player in the game because it is like 70% of what's in sea salt. So, you know, the, the, the big player and the thing that you really need to spend some money on when you're manufacturing salt um, and it's true of other products too, but if we're talking about sea salt itself for our aquariums, 70% sodium chloride. So that's a big nut when it comes to what's the cost of, of that. And, and the other point I like to make about this is that people think, and I see this all the time on, on, you know, like online forums and stuff where people say, oh, you know, buy this. So I didn't want to get it so branded about salts, but I'm the Tropic Marin guy. I got to do it a little bit. Um, uh, people always say, you know, oh, I, I buy this salt because it has more stuff in it, right? It's not about that, dude. It's not about that. What you're paying for when you're paying a higher premium 
for a higher priced salt, you're actually paying for what's not in the box. You're paying for that refinement process that got all that stuff that's not sodium chloride out of the sodium chloride. And I'll tell you something, magnesium, which is the second largest player in this game of percentages, um, it, uh, pure magnesium, clean magnesium is super expensive. And magnesium is one of the, one of the biggest culprits when it comes to introducing contaminants into salt. Even though there's so much less magnesium in there per unit of volume than there is sodium chloride, the magnesium is, all, if you don't pay a lot of money for a really clean magnesium, you're always introducing some kind of junk. So we saw that uh, when we were doing some analysis, like all the inexpensive ones, you know, have really low levels of magnesium. I, I asked about it before and like, I got a straight answer, which is because, yeah, it's expensive. It's expensive to get clean stuff. Yeah, so uh, like the goal here is to keep this as cheap as possible. And then, you know, kind of the response in the community is to, well, I'll just add more magnesium. I actually did the math on that, man. And it's cheaper just to buy it with yeah. it in there. Uh, the salt bucket magnesium is cheaper than even the bulk magnesium. Yeah, a lot of that is because the, the amount of magnesium you need in your tank is so high. Um, you know, if you think about like calcium, you're talking about numbers of like 440 or 450, right? But when you're talking about magnesium, now you're talking about 13, 14, 1500. To raise that up in your tank, you got to add a lot of magnesium. Okay, so well, no, like the other process now is you screwed up the balance of the salt because what's now I've added cups of magnesium to get the magnesium up. Now the salinity is up, so I'm going to have to dilute this to make it uh, back to the right 35 ppt. And now what I've done is made the uh, calcium alkalinity and everything else diluted. Yeah, and, and it, it's, a, it's a factor when it comes to the calcium and magnesium, but a small factor where it really becomes a factor is the trace elements because now your trace elements are in such tiny quantities that when you start decreasing those because of what you're talking about, now you're talking about taking them down close to zero. Well, you don't have the ability to, to test for them in real time yeah, right. and correct for them like you can calcium alkalinity right, exactly. as well. All right, next one here is, uh, this one is interesting because like, <laughs> You are jumping right into the lion's den with this one. Uh, your issue that you're having with your tank is most likely not your salt batch. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, uh, Tropic Marin, like, what was it, like two years ago? I don't know. Yeah. A while ago, ha had an issue, replaced all the salt. Uh, it's debatable whether or not the issue is real. We'll have a, another discussion about that maybe. But why is it most likely not your salt batch I'm going to give a slightly different opinion than you on this one, but okay. go ahead. Well, there's a reason I put that in there. And the reason I put that in there is because I get so many calls from people where they're complaining that they got a bad batch of salt because something's going on in their system. And I always track it down. I always, you know, go through the steps of checking the lot number and doing the, the samples and all of that. But what I'm trying to usually get them to do is to at the same time, let's figure out what's going on in your system. Because what happens is they blame whatever's going on on their, on their salt. And then they say, well, that's the problem. And they don't look for any other possibilities and they lose all this time blaming it on the batch of salt. Now, let me tell you something. I've been with Tropic Marin now for a little over 25 years the number of actual bad batches that I've seen of our salt, I can't speak for any other company, but there's a reason I say this in relation to all companies, and I'll go into that in a second. The number of bad batches that I've seen, I can easily count on one hand in 25 years. And none of those that actually turned out to have a problem would be a problem that would translate into a critical issue in your aquarium. OK, the reason I make this general statement really in relation to all salts is that all salt manufacturers have standards that they go by. They all test their batches in some way, shape or form. If you're having a problem with your tank, it's probably not your salt. I'm not saying by this, it's not your salt. Forget about it being your ba your, a bad batch. What I'm saying is that make that your last assumption 
not your first assumption, because 99% of the time, we're going to figure out what it actually was and fix it before we ever get to that assumption. Okay, believe it or not, for many years I answered the phones here. Uh, and so I took calls all the time about, you know, my tank just uh, is going totally south. Yeah. You know, help me. I think it's X, Y, Z. Yeah. Right. I got to tell you, something on the magnitude of 92% of the time, man, couldn't be further from whatever they thought it was. Yeah. yeah. Uh, it's just like, it's human nature to think I, you know, picked up this pen uh, and then I got cancer. It must be this pen. You know, uh, like it's just like human nature to think the last thing that you've done is the thing that caused it. Yeah. You know, especially if there's no real window into it. Yeah. You know, OK. And so I, the reality is, is like if I did a 20 percent water change with any salt out there and then the tank crap the bed, that thing is rat poison, man. Because 80 percent like you just put like barely any in there, man. And the whole thing went you know, south. And there'd be a thousand other people with tanks that also had their tanks completely it'd decimated. Yeah, it'd be everywhere. Yeah. And so this is that point that like, like people call up and say, hey, you know, this carbon, you know, nuke my tank or whatever. Yeah. And they're like, all right, well, I got news for you, dude. If this carbon was so toxic that it nuked your tank, uh, there isn't like one special gram of poison in your batch of carbon, man. It would be in, I'd be getting, not just you, because anybody who used that carbon, uh, it'd be, I'd be getting my, the phone would be ringing off the hook. Now, what sometimes happens, what sometimes causes confusion of this is, let's, let's use your carbon issue, right? Um, I, I, I started running this carbon and it, and it nuked my tank, right? So something wrong with the carbon. What may have happened is that the effect that the carbon had on the water column identified a different problem that ended up nuking the tank. Mm -hmm. And so indirectly, did the carbon nuke the tank? Well, yes, but it wasn't the carbon that did it. It was the other problem that got amplified by the change that you made. That happens a lot. GFO comes to mind. Yeah. So uh, forever, man, you're getting like, you know, phone calls and you see it on the forum all the time, just widely adopted that if you use GFO, and strip all of it out, the whole tank's gonna crap the bed, right? Okay, well, I got news for you. That does not happen like anything anything close to approaching all the time, right? Yeah. So it happens sometimes. So sometimes you'll see a negative result from stripping all the phosphate out. Yeah. We talked about this a little bit earlier. But now what is it that's unique to you that 90% of people aren't having this thing, but I am? And it could be that, well, I started with 200 pho or, uh, or a phosphate of, uh, of 2.5 and I took it down to 0 0.03 in a single day. Yeah. Well, then, yeah, right? Uh, but then all the other people are kind of like, yeah, I was already at you know, 0.1 and brought it down to 0 0.03. Okay, like there are always things. And there's also just like this t tank is just stressed in general. Yeah. Right? And so th these corals, most people could not tell the difference between like a level 10 healthy coral, an eight, or even a five. A five and a 10 looks basically the same to yeah. most people, right? So your tank, you're, you're about to skip over into really negative territory, and it just takes one little change, man. It could be, I did the water change and I exposed it to the air, you know, and it could be And that. sometimes it's, it's not even an obvious thing, right? We talked about going, you know, change being slow. Um, I get so many people that call me up and say, my tank is, is going downhill, it looks terrible, and I did this ICP test and here's what it showed. Well, my first question to them is, do you have an ICP test from when the tank was doing well? And 99% of the time they say, well, no, the tank was doing well, I didn't do a test. Well, if you didn't do a test when the tank was doing well, then this test now doesn't tell me a whole lot. It, it is very difficult, but you can look at, oh, look at cobalt a little bit up. Uh, you know, we tanks of cobalt. Maybe it up? was up before. Yeah, yeah. Like maybe it was even high. Like there's no way to know. Water change probably took it down. And I've seen tanks look amazing under parameters that I would think would be horrible and wouldn't be able to run. So you, there's, there's no, there's no mm. one set of parameters where there's certainly a set of parameters that we shoot for, but there's no one set of parameters that we can that anybody can say if you run this, your tank is going to look great. You know what I guess I would say is if you thought it was the salt. 
Not would I send the ICP of the tank. I'd send the ICP of the tank and the salt yeah, to see what the differences are. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And and we as a company, I don't know about the other companies, but I'm sure they do what we do. We as a company always follow up on complaints like that. We always backtrack. We've got you know batch samples from every batch we've ever made, and we always go back into it. We always look at our, our testing during manufacturing and all of that. But it is true that more than 90% of the time, it's 99% of the time, it's not that salt batch that was causing the problem. And so don't lose the time blaming it on the salt. If you want me to look into some salt batch, call me, let me know what the salt batch is and I'll look into it. In the meantime, let's figure out what the problem really was. Okay, so this gets into the bit for me, which is like, if you go in on a forum and say, you know, hey, I used X salt, I used Tropic Marine salt, my fish jumped out. Right. Yeah. OK. Uh, did anybody else have that? And you see 20 other people come out and say that You're like me too. OK. Sky is falling now. Right. <laughs> and you're like, of course, this is like toxic poison. Right. Yeah. But what you didn't see is behind that is there are three thousand, you know, nine hundred and eighty people that didn't have that experience. Yeah. yeah. So what is the thing here? And now if I ask that in a room, and you looked out and I asked that question and you saw 20 hands go up and then you saw the 3,980 not go up, it'd be really obvious. Like, no, nah, there's something unique going on here, yeah. right? Okay, so that is one of the things that the, the world that we live in is kind of challenging. So mm -hmm. it's really important to say that you didn't because I like, you know, you know, people say I defend the Tropic Rinse Salt, and I do, man, because I use it, you know? And, you know, when you guys had that debacle, you know, like two years ago, we used it through the entire thing here, yeah. right? Uh, 160 used it through the whole thing there. The 750 used it. The E170 used it. We used it all through all, all the experiments here. Never saw a hiccup other than, yes, the bins had a little bit more brown gum. Yeah, and, and, and that brown stuff, by the way, did not come from the fact that it was manufactured in the Turkish facility. You know what I feel like is you guys kind of got a bad rap here in a bit because all the other ones are brown garbage, right? Yeah. And so, like, you just kind of, like, dipped your quality level down for a minute to everybody else's level. It, it wasn't actually <laughs> quality level. What it was was that the, the manganese and the iron in the raw materials has a, a much higher threshold in the grades that we use than what would cause this. And so when you're getting these raw materials in, for years they were at one level and then they came out a little bit higher. And it was just kind of a perfect storm that these slightly higher levels that caused that brown uh, precipitate uh, happened at the same time that we were having the whole turkey facility thing. I will tell you, you were not the only facility to continue to use the product from Turkey. We have large livestockers and zoos and aquariums that so were using this about the whole thing. We set up test tanks side by side in Germany and universities. There was nothing wrong with that salt. There were a few people that lost corals during that period of time that blamed it on the salt that had something else going on. And we're very sorry they lost sorrels, uh, corals, but I am really super proud of the way Tropic Marin said, look, it's gonna take us months to identify yes or no, is there a problem with this salt? And we don't wanna risk our customers' tanks in the meantime. So we'll replace everything now. So this is the bit here for me. Wait, I got one more thing I okay, gotta say go about that. I even took uh, crap for that because I had people on the forums afterwards, because we, even after we identified that there was nothing wrong with the salt, I set an end date for when we were gonna end the replacement, and it was way after that, because I wanted people that still wanted to get their salt replaced, be able to get it replaced, right? I took crap for that, because people got online and they said, well, if they know there's nothing wrong with the salt, why are they still replacing it? Because and we've been doing it for four months or five months. Okay, so, here is the bit for me, and I've seen this. So I'm going to flip this on its head. Like, you're saying that there's no such thing as a bad batch. Oh, and I, I, yes, almost there never. There is, because, like, I've seen them. Yeah. And, and this is what it looks like. Uh, I've seen it where a uh, pallet goes to, like, a local club. Yeah. Uh, or a specific area that buys from a specific store. And cluster bomb, man. Mm -hmm. Like, in that club that bought that pallet, 
almost everybody who did a water change has a problem. Mm -hmm. I've seen this many times now. Okay, that when everyone or nearly everyone is having that problem, yeah. for sure. You right? ever see that with Tropic Marin? Never. Right? Okay, just want to make sure. Okay, that's <laughs> that's the other bit is that like, you know, like people like to, you know, hit the man who stumbled, right? It's just it's human nature. Yeah, I, I don't yeah. know, right? Uh, hit them while they're down. Uh, but the reality is, is like all of these people have done this. All the salts, every one of them man, has had issues. Yeah. Most of them are really quiet about it. Okay. It's not how you behave when things are going well that I'll judge you by. Mm -hmm. It's how you behave when things go bad. Right? Yeah. Okay. So I, I think of Costco actually in my mind. One day, man, I had a broken Keurig, right? Yeah. So a broken Keurig. Uh, and I've, I've been making coffee on this thing like two years. Right. And on the way out, I was like, hey, how long is the warranty on this thing? And I never do warranty. Right. And mm -hmm. just like, I don't know what made me ask, you know, and I watched like the little desk and they're like, oh, just bring it in. Like, no, you don't understand. Like it was like two years ago. I just sent it into Keurig. I don't have a box for it. It's it's made something the magnitude of 3000 cups of coffee. I'm like, no, just bring it in. And I'm like, I was curiosity struck. I brought the Keurig thing in my old dirty coffee machine. And they searched, I didn't even the receipt. They searched for my history, found it, and they gave me cash, man. Really? Cash for it. Wow. Greenbacks. Wow. Right? Okay, and then I looked up at the return policy and it says, if you don't like it, return it. Uh, except computers and jewelry. Uh, and I'm like, wow, man. Wow. So when the chips were down, and they didn't even really drop the ball in this case, but now I feel safe buying anything from Costco wow. forever. Because the other people got my back. That's pretty impressive. Yeah, it like boggles the mind, you yeah. know? Uh, but like these people stand up for it. And so now when you look at a bunch of other ones, I'll tell you, I also know bad batches because I have people that uh, do uh, work in the livestock industry. Mm -hmm. And they use the cheapest stuff that they can find because it's, you know, a component of doing business. Yeah. Right? yeah. Okay. But they fully admit, man, they'll mix up batches all the time where the pH is like six. And the and they're like gassing it off doesn't help. There's something in there, man, that is causing the pH I to be even six. Understand that? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and like there are or alkalinity, like and especially in the cheaper ones that don't get mixed as long because mixing is a big cost yeah. of the whole thing. It's a limit of the operation. It, if they don't get mixed long enough, man, the alkalinity and stuff is way way mm -hmm. off. You know, and you know what they do? They just throw it away. Because it's cheaper to buy the cheap stuff yeah, yeah. and then, you know, like go through the testing. So the difference between here is the average person who mixes this up at home would never test calcium, alkalinity, magnesium and pH before they enter the tank. Right. They're not testing that seawater. In right. There. OK. But in a commercial environment where they know better, they know that that's what this is going to do and they're going to run into these issues. Uh, it's just cheaper to do the testing and yeah. throw away the bad batches. Yeah. Uh, so, like, I understand your standards and the German standards. Yeah. Why you're not running this thing and it seems absurd to you, but it's real. It happens. It's just rare. I would listen to your counsel, though, which is it's probably 99% of the case something else. Yeah. But it could be. Definitely test. Uh, that's one takeaway for me. It's like, you should always, always test the uh, salt water before. It's not it. a bad idea. It's the, at least the simple, easy things to test. You know, definitely pH. Alkalinity is a quick, easy, cheap test. Checker. Like it take you know no time. Those are good things to check mm -hmm. when you're when you're making up fresh water. Well, the person I'm talking about actually has two pH probes in there because they don't even trust mm -hmm. it to the point that one. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, moving on to the next one here uh, is number four, which is you know I don't even remember all these what I wrote. So every time he starts, I'm thinking, how much did I stick my neck out on this next one? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right. Chase trends, oh, yeah. not numbers. Uh, hallelujah. Yeah. Yeah. Like I get so many calls from people that are like, oh my calcium is 418 ppm. What's the best way to get it to 421 and a half? You know, it's like, that is not how we do this. Um, it's all about trends. Are things going down? Are things going up? Are things staying nice and stable? You're really chasing trends, not specific numbers. That doesn't mean that the numbers don't matter. They do. But 
at the end of the day, your corals can accommodate to lots of different conditions. What's important to them is the stability of those conditions and the way those conditions are maintained. And so if you're, if you're constantly chasing numbers, there's two real big downsides to it. Number one, you're never gonna be happy with the numbers because you're never gonna stick on the number you wanna be on. Like how do you hit 0.03 phosphate it, yeah, all the it, time? It doesn't happen. <laughs> You're, you're not going to be at 423 ppm of calcium, you know, every time you test. Your, your test kit can't even do that for you. Okay, so that's the real joke here is that a lot of test kits it could be plus or minus 10%, which yeah. means that your 420 could easily be four or 380. Yeah, exactly. You, you know, uh, yeah. and that's A, the test kit's like inexpensive hobby grade test kit, but also very, very few people it says spin for a minute are hitting the timer. You know, it uh, feels like a minute, I think. Uh, you know, and it just it, is your, it, are you holding the vial this way this time to make your drop or that way? You know, it's like there's so much variables in all of that. So what, what I try to get across to people is chase the trend of what your tank is doing, not the specific numbers. You certainly want to be in the area of the parameters that you're looking for, but if you're if you're trying to run 430 calcium and you tested today and it's 410, don't freak out. Like that's, don't start dumping calcium into your tank. You might test tomorrow and it's 440 tomorrow, and that's all part of the margins on your test kit. So, it's the trend chasing, not the number. Oh wait, I didn't get I didn't get past the, the first thing is you're never gonna get. I didn't get to two things. The first thing is you're never gonna get there. You're never going to hit that number and always be on that number. And the second thing is, to me, it takes all the fun of the hobby away. Oh, because, yeah, chasing all you know, all you're doing is chasing numbers every day and you're never really sitting and enjoying your, your system, which is really why we do all of this. approach in the first mad place. scientists pretty quick, you know. Uh, so for me, people always ask, like, uh, is the Hannah Checker, you know, as accurate as a test kit? And the answer is don't care. Uh, it is consistent. If I, if I took 10 people here and asked them all to test the water, they would all come up with the same result. Uh, and then uh, combined with that, the, the guys at Worldwide yeah. told me one of the reasons they picked nine as the DKH is because it's about two points away from danger in either yeah. direction. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, which is we're all yeah, going to mess stuff up. I agree with that 100%. I like that approach. Yeah, like, like if you're riding seven, man, like natural seawater, well, man, you better peg that. Uh, um, yeah, it's with the one exception that there, it depends a little bit on what you're keeping. You know, um, there's a there's an awful lot of research that, that talks about certain species of acros not liking that, that alkalinity to creep up too high. And, you know, so I think it depends a little bit on what you're keeping and how your system runs. But at the end of the day, staying right in the middle of a decent range, I think that's a good thing. Okay, so for me, one of the things though, dude, is I go to, like we could debate the purpose of alkalinity yeah. all the time. Uh, the biggest piece of advice I can give is, go find somebody you trust and emulate them. And if I go and watch these people that are growing corals for a living, like they're actually growing them fast enough that it can support a strip mall facility and like a, you know, 60 employees because yeah. they're producing them that fast. Whatever they're doing, I want some of that. Yeah, but you, know? you also have to remember if you're going to, if you're going to, you know, model them for alkalinity, you also need to model them for nutrients because mm -hmm. that alkalinity, that optimum alkalinity is going to depend on where those net nutrient levels are. Okay, is. that's a good point because these people feed by the hour. Yeah, yeah. By see. these people, I mean uh, yeah, the uh, worldwide team. They feed by the hour, super duper high flow. They perfected all the other stuff yep. too, right? Yeah, so, so it's not just one thing. You got to look at the full picture. That's, I mean, this gets back to, I mean, you guys have all heard this, the Toll House cookie recipe, man. If I was going to make a cookie, man, I'm going to follow the thing in the back. I'm not going to say, Oh, all that stuff, but wouldn't it be fun to put three times as much baking soda in there? Uh, no, you never do that. You yeah. follow the actual thing. So, yeah. uh, I mean, there's a whole series based on that. All right. So, uh, <laughs> next one here. Oh, this one is always the most touchy subject known to man. What did Can't, I do this for? <laughs> I know. This is a dangerous one. Uh, but you're probably on the right side of it, which is number five is forget the red field ratio. Oh, yeah. This is an easy one. Okay. I know. This is an easy one. Um, there's, there's a few really important things to know about Redfield. Redfield ratio was done on surface algae in deep water, okay? 
And um, that's where this 16 or what is 16 or 18 to one ratio came from of nitrates to phosphates. The reason it took off, the reason everybody looked at that and said, oh, this is the ocean and this is the way it is, is because Redfield found that both in the surface algae in that deep water and in the same ratio in the surface water, surface water in that deep water. Time out. Yeah. Okay, just for to get everybody else who is watching this who's never heard of the Redfield up to speed, basically the theory that everybody has uh, shared is there's 16 to one nitrogen to phosphorus in the ocean, which means you know potentially we should match that same kind of ratio in the tank, which would mean you know if I had one, 0 0.1 parts per million uh, phosphate, I should have 1.6, uh, or uh, I guess it'd be like two or something. Yeah, right? 1.6. Yeah. Uh, okay, I found, oh, it actually is 1.6 because yeah. they say nitrogen to phosphorus. Well, it depends on if you're talking about nitrogen to phosphate, or phosphorus or nitrate to phosphate. If you change it to nitrate to phosphate, it's closer to 10 to one. Yeah. So, uh, or at least that was my math that I did. <laughs> uh, so it would be the 1.6 to 0.1. Okay, so if it's true in the ocean, we tend to like believe it's true in the tank, we should chase those things. Also, you'll see tons and tons of people out there that will tell you that if the ratio is off, it causes green algae. If it's ratio off, it causes red algae. It causes uh, this slime or that slime or whatever the ratio. Okay, so I just wanna bring everybody to speed. That is the conversation now uh, on time. I'm sorry, I, I totally no, tried to wreck you. It, no, it's, it's great. The, so, so this Redfield ratio, took off because he showed that this, this ratio of 16 to one of nitrogen to phosphorus was in the, in the algae itself, but then also in the surrounding water, which was the surface water of these deep water areas. And everybody said, oh, well, that's what the ocean is, so that's what it must be everywhere. It took off in that way, and then we discovered that the ratio on a coral reef, on the water on a coral reef, is actually very, very different. I'm gonna talk about this in a different way later, but on a coral reef, it is ultra low nutrient. It's where the whole ultra low nutrient approach for keeping reefs, uh, reef aquariums kind of came from. Um, I'm not saying I'm on board with that approach uh, because there's other things that influence that, which again, we're gonna get into, but uh, it's very different. The water quality, when, it, when you're looking at nitrogen and phosphorus on a coral reef, is completely different than surface water in deep water ocean. And so forget about Redfield. When you hear people talking about Redfield, don't apply that to your, to your reef tank. Um, and, and we need to talk about the other things in relation to nitrogen and phosphorus that you have to apply to your reef tank. But Redfield is not valid for reef tanks or even for uh, wild reef environments. Okay, so the reason I said you endangered this one is because I've, I've approached this subject a couple of times, you get roasted every time. Yeah, right? I'm gonna get roasted for it, what I just said too. It, it's, it's like a bad word, <laughs> yeah. man. And I, this is kind of my take on it, is I know full well that there are organisms in the tank that will take advantage of the fact that there's really high of one thing mm -hmm. and really low of another thing. Mm -hmm. Like uh, specifically uh, with nitrate and phosphate, if you got one that's like zero, well, you know, like Bryopsis for me will absorb the ammonia instead yeah. of the, the nitrate, right? And you'll never even know that you had a problem. You, and getting nitrate low doesn't help because it's actually getting it as you add the food in every yeah. day. Uh, it seems like some of the slimes of the world uh, can take advantage of the fact that they can scavenge out the limited amount of nitrate and phosphate faster than the good things can. Mm -hmm. And so the bad things always win. Mm -hmm. You know, They can actually replicate themselves so fast. So uh, now you apply this to the red field ratio and it's like, I'm not telling you like 10 to one is the right number. And if you've got 10 to one, then that's great. I will tell you though, that we've tested this with foods and stuff mm -hmm. that we put seafoods in the tank and it's usually pretty close. Uh, if I add the food to the tank every day, the net result is about 10 to one nitrate to phosphate mm -hmm. uh, rising. Okay, the problem then becomes is everybody cares about the phosphate being really low. They want it 0.03 or 0.1 or whatever. 
they don't really care about nitrate. But it's impossible to keep both of those because you're adding both of them every mm -hmm. single day and they're kind of in that ratio. So uh, one of the things when I bring this up is 10 to one, don't chase numbers, mm -hmm. right? If you got 3,000 to one, <laughs> don't be surprised if that causes some unknown biology problem mm -hmm. because the corals and everything in that tank did not evolve in that scenario and nature doesn't make a whole lot of mistakes. Yeah. You know, uh, I was told actually uh, recently that biology doesn't make a whole lot of mistakes. So mm, don't chase 10 to one, but also don't believe 3,000 to one is also not an issue because it probably is. Does that seem fair? Yeah, absolutely. And, it, and, and, and I always come back to the same thing. It depends on how your particular system runs. I know a lot of systems that run high, higher nutrient levels, look awesome, lower nutrient levels, look great. But also the converse is true. You know, I, I know systems that are running at exactly the parameters they should be running as far as we can measure, and somehow the corals aren't happy. Okay, so that's the interesting part is because this again gets to like kind of anecdotal stuff, which is if I was a reefer and I corrected to 10 to one, you know, I had 300 to one and I corrected to 10 to one, and all of a sudden my diatom problem goes away or whatever problem I was having, it's impossible for me not to go out there and tell the oh, world, yeah. man, that uh, red shield red fuel ratio is great. But what you corrected from is 300 to one. What about if somebody was at, at uh, 15 to one, you know, which is 50% wrong, you know, mm -hmm. but we're not talking about 50%, we're talking about like, you know, 10,000% wrong, right? So uh, there to me, I wouldn't say chase the red field ratio, but I would say that the hobby could develop some like guidelines, some, some kind of like ratio or levels that we all generally agree on are safe. Like, because the problem for me is you ask somebody what's the right nitrate level. Tell me, do you, you've been doing this for how long? 25 years? Over 25 years. Yeah, I've been doing it for 20. I don't know a single person that knows the correct answer to what should my nitrate level be. Mm -hmm. Again, all of you want to hear it. Uh, I would tell you that worldwide doesn't go above 20. That seems like a good threshold for me then. I don't know, it doesn't seem to hold them back. Uh, I would tell you the ocean is like zero or close to zero. Uh, I found that unless you're really, really adding tons of food and stuff in to make up for it, that's bad. Mm -hmm. uh, so somewhere in between there is probably good. Well, and, and it's influenced by other things, you know? We, we can't say what's the perfect nitrate number without knowing what the phosphate number is, mm -hmm. right? And the other place that this gets really complicated is if we look at the water on a coral reef, it's ultra low nutrient level, super low nitrate, nitrogen, super low phosphate, phosphorus. So where do those corals get the nutrients that they need? Well, that gets into this whole other thing where we, we run our tanks in the exact opposite way that a coral reef runs. We're trying to reach certain levels and keep it consistent 100% of the time. We're looking for stability of those levels. That's not the way corals get their nutrients. Corals get their nutrients by living in this ultra low nutrient environment for this, this bleeds into one of our other All points. right, you know what? I'm gonna pause you right yeah. now because you're <laughs> bleeding over right in the next one, uh, which is corals need nutrients, forget the ultra low nutrient approach, especially in relation to PO4. I wish more hobbyists could embrace this as truth. Now yeah. let you go. All right, so uh, sorry, I was bleeding into that, but um, it, was, it, was, it was the perfect segue. So corals live in this ultra low nutrient environment for most of their life. So the question is then, if phosphate, particularly phosphate is so crucial to them, how do they get it? Where do they get it from? Well, they get it in what I'm, what I'm gonna call nutrient pulses. What happens is big school of uh, Jack Crevalli or big school of Moorish idols or a big school of mullet come by and they poop all over the reef. All of a sudden, that nutrient environment that has been so low changed to a very high nutrient environment, but in a particulate nutrient form. So these corals are not taking dissolved nitrates and phosphates out of the water column. 
they're getting particulate nutrients that fall right on them. Um, it was funny, I just did a lecture about, about nutrients and I, I had to find a video of fish poop. And the only videos of fish pooping that I could find were parrotfish. And if you go on the internet and you look at YouTube for you know fish poop, you're gonna find tons of parrotfish pooping videos because that's how sand is made, right? They eat the mm -hmm. corals, they crunch it up, and they poop it out. And next time you go to the beach and you run your fingers in the sand or your toes, realize that you're, you're in parrotfish poop. Um, so uh, there's tons of that. So in my lecture, I had to put a parrotfish pooping video because I couldn't find a Moorish Idol pooping video. But the point is that these corals go from this ultra low nutrient environment to an extremely high nutrient rich particulate nutrient supply environment. 15 minutes later, back to the ultra low nutrient environment. There's this pulsing of nutrients that happens that they have a wonderful mechanism for assimilating those nutrients. Um, by the way, we measure sometimes the wrong things in our aquariums. We're measuring, from, for the most part, nitrates, for instance, and corals don't really want nitrates. There's not enough nitrogen in the nitrates. They would much rather get ammonium, and they get ammonium from uric acid and the, the fish urine, and the fish gills uh, secrete a lot of ammonium. So we're measuring nitrate because that's what we can measure. And it is somewhat of an indication of the amount of nitrogen in the tank, but it's not really the form that the corals really want. So we're kind of measuring something on the side of what they're really looking for. But the point is that this pulsing that happens is largely how the corals get their nutrients. And we do exactly the opposite in our tanks. We try to find some level that when it's sustained, just gives the corals what they need, but isn't too much to allow the bad guys to grow. I keep going worldwide here, man. Feed by the hour, and they talk about uh, uh, what they feed the corals, and it's fish poo. Uh, and <laughs> the reason they do yeah. so well is because the fish are pooing all the time. Yes. Right? They're not feeding a lot. They're feeding a little, but there's literally an alarm there. They turn every single time, and they feed every hour. There's an alarm turning it. When it goes off, whoever's near it needs to go feed. Yeah. Right? Okay, so this is the piece that I've seen over 20 years, which is like, oh, I got tons of algae. You know, nutrients are our enemy. Let's go all the way to zero, zero. Oh, now all the corals are, you know, getting pale and dying and don't build tissue. We're like, oh, we need uh, more nitrate and phosphate. And then we got algae again. And then it's just like, uh, like okay, th that isn't what's happening in the ocean. So the ocean and any in the places where these corals are grown and i'm not talking about like some dirty you know uh lagoon or whatever yeah like where these things are collected uh in a vast majority of cases like almost undetectable nitrate and phosphate yeah right but fish poo also plankton mm -hmm. uh, you go there in the morning man and uh like uh, or late at night and the water's just clouded with bacteria yeah. and plankton and stuff. And the waves and stuff will stir up detritus and stuff that totally. they're eating, the poo. So what they're getting it is in the form of organics. So, and the, part of the reason probably they, they can do it in pulses is because they're gonna capture essentially that bacteria. They have to digest it and like break it down. Mm -hmm. And so they got like a little nitrogen and phosphorus battery now inside yeah. of them. And the way that you say they like ammonia, you know, these aren't like complex digestive tracts. Yeah. They're literally like letting it rot in there. Yeah, ammonium. Right? Yeah, ammonium. Um, um, you know, ammonia is a little toxic for them, but ammonium. Yeah. And and it, it really is true. Um, I don't like to be producty about it. I'm not here to be producty, but um, all of this research about this pulsing has spawned new products for us. You know, we have two new products now about phosphate addition, one for starting tanks and one for maintaining uh, phosphate in, in, in an established reef, Phosstart and Phosfeed. We don't have them here in the US yet, they'll be here shortly. But these, are, these products are designed exactly to do that. Particulate phosphate that doesn't dissolve into the water column that you sprinkle in the tank that falls down just like fish poop all over the corals. I can't wait to hear, see how this conversation turns out because this is yet a new different evolution, which is, uh, it's not organic. It is, uh, uh, it's not going to decay. 
you know? Right. Uh, and so it's a little particulate of phosphate. Like, what happens if the, cap the coral captures that? Like, can they digest it or break, not break it down into something? Because in the tank, probably not uh, normal pH is going to uh, actually dissolve, yeah. but in the coral, it will. Yeah, it doesn't actually, I mean, a, a small amount of it dissolves. You, you might see the phosphate go up a little bit in your system, but, but it's not about that. It's about supplying those phosphates while you've got that low nutrient level in the system. Okay, I, I keep going back to this in my mind, and I, I always think of, you know, how Europe is often a little ahead of us, you know? Uh, and I just always think of how the KZ system it, it, it attracts this. And I think there's evolutions of this, but mm -hmm. like, you know, like if they would have just told everybody what they were doing instead of just magic, you know, you know, like German snake elixir, you know, uh, a special <laughs> German snake. Uh, Cause that's what it felt like. That's the way my club talked about it is it's all fake. But really what it was, was we're going to maintain, we're going to carbon dose. Right. Uh, we're going to maintain ultra low levels of nitrogen and phosphorus, very similar to the ocean. But we also know that that's terrible for the coral. And so we're not going to add nitrate and phosphate, you know, or let that build up because that grows algae, which is terrible for a display. Uh, and what we're going to do is we're going to add organics, amino acids and other things that take to supply the intermittent pulses of nitrogen mm -hmm. and phosphorus and other nutrients via these little bottles. So it was like no algae, colorful corals. And now, like, I mean, back, that was like one of the only ways to do it, but they didn't even call it carbon dosing back then. It was yeah. just zeobit, yeah. right? Now we've evolved carbon dosing into something totally different and we're not necessarily always pumping rocks. Yeah, I'm a huge fan of carbon dosing. Yeah, and so and that was the carbon dosing was, and the rocks was creating that bacterial mulm that would feed the corals as well. You know, at, at the same time, you, you talk about algae and bac, you know, bacteria growth. Um, I always try to get people to realize that, they, they, you know, people are always saying, I wanna create this perfect little chunk of the ocean in my living room. And it's actually not true. You know, they wanna create most hobbyists want to create a chunk of the ocean that grows aggressively all the stuff that they think looks really cool and doesn't grow any of the stuff that normally grows right next to that on a coral reef. Like you go diving on any coral reef in the world and you're going to find green hair algae and, and cyanobacteria and, you know, brown crap. I mean, it's there. And the reason it's there is because it wants the same conditions that your corals want. Um, in a perfect world, the corals are aggressive enough growers that they keep that other stuff down and it doesn't flip the other way around as it sometimes does in our reef tanks. But you're not trying to create a perfect little chunk of the ocean. You're trying to create this aberrant chunk of the ocean, grows all that cool stuff that you think is pretty and looks nice and doesn't grow any of the stuff that normally is right next to it in a reef. Okay, so I'll go out like in spirit of emulating the ocean. Let's say we want to emulate the ocean uh, that looks like our tanks, which has high levels of nitrate and phosphate, riddled with algae, right? I mean, like all, yeah. always, the, the, the tanks can't eat it fast enough, yeah, yeah. right? So if you think we're going to manage that, basically what we're doing, the approach that we've done was swing back and forth, and we're only talking about nitrate and ni phosphate, not talking about organic nitrate mm -hmm. and phosphate, uh, or even a particulate phosphate, but not having that kind of conversation, we're just swinging back and forth, and we're... Only focus is, can the coral scavenge enough nitrate uh, and phosphate out of the water in a really abnormal behavior for yeah. it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, can we make it survive this desire? Uh, the conversation going forward has got to be somewhere in the middle. Yeah, and I think that, um, you know, this whole idea of when we're talking about nitrates um, of ammonium and, and uh, your, your urea, um, is an important conversation because there's like, I don't remember, I'm not a chemist, but there's like four or five times as much nitrogen in, in, in ammonium than there is in, in nitrate. So the corals really want that. Uh, and you never see that. You're not testing for it. You don't see it. It's in your tank, but you're not testing for it. You don't see it. Um, so I think that as much as we know what we know, we're still learning, you know, and, and this whole idea of pulsing and particulate addition of, of nutrients I think is the next step of evolution of understanding how we can get a tank system to act more like what happens in the ocean. You know what's going through my mind this whole time? Thinking there, watching yellow tanes snorkel, eating all the algae and stuff off the rock, 
and literally pooping it right back onto yeah. the reef mm -hmm. while they're there eating yeah. it, right? And these fish, by the way, have really poor digestive tracts. So they actually only pull out a small portion of the uh, nitrogen and phosphorus for their own use. And the rest is just processed into little particles that then feeds the yeah. reef. So uh, totally different thing. All right, number seven. We're only up to seven? Yeah, I know, man, <laughs> good stuff here. Okay, number seven, overfeeding is a great way to increase uh, nitrate and phosphate concentrations. Yeah, um, I get both ends of the spectrum in calls. My nutrients are too high, how am I gonna get them down? My nutrients bottomed out to zero, how do I get them up? And when you're on that end of the spectrum, the least expensive, easiest, quickest road to raising the nutrient level is overfeeding the tank. And what I try to get people to understand is it doesn't matter if that food that you put in is eaten by the fish or not. It's gonna end up as nitrates and phosphates. It, it doesn't have to be processed by the fish. And what I mean by overfeeding is um, number one, if you gotta raise your phosphate level along with your nitrate level, go out and find the least, in, the most inexpensive food that you can possibly find because phosphate is a fairly cheap preservative. And in general, and I'm not saying this is true of all foods, but in general, less expensive foods use a little bit more phosphate as a, as a preservative. At least I think that's true. And so if you need to raise your phosphate and nitrate level, go buy some really inexpensive food and overfeed your tank. What's overfeeding your tank? Overfeeding your tank is putting enough food in that your fish can't eat it all when you put it in. Some of it falls down. You know, so overfeeding your tank though, like, I, mean, I keep going with worldwide examples because yeah, they come yeah. to mind, is uh, most people wouldn't feed every single hour. So instead of feeding so much that they can't eat anymore, what they're doing is they're feeding them in ways that they can eat more yeah, yeah. and process it into yeah, the Yeah, but the amount of particles. food going into that tank mm -hmm. is way more than most people do. Yeah, way, you know, way, way, way more. Most people are feeding one or tw once or twice a day. Mm -hmm. um, and and I'm, I'm all for that approach. I mean, I think it's, it's basically the same thing. I think the reason I say overfeeding is where you're feeding so much that the fish can't eat it all is because most people don't feed every hour, you know? Oh. And so if you're gonna overfeed the tank and you're only feeding once or twice or three times a day, you gotta feed more than what those fish can eat to really get the tank overfed. Oh, okay, so now we swing all the way back though, like I'm, I'm gonna go overfeed and if I do it wrong, now LG slimes and crap because I overfed. So this is that part where uh, again, worldwide, I'm, I'm, like I just, just saw, I love it when the pieces of the puzzle are yeah, coming yeah. together. Okay, so worldwide is talking about heavy in, heavy out. Mm -hmm. And then I see it all over the forums all the time. Like, well, why would I bother putting heavy in and just to, just to take it out? Isn't that just wasteful? Like, no, what I'm doing is I'm putting tons of organic uh, particles into the food or in there but then the stuff that isn't eaten, I'm getting it out of the tank so it doesn't pollute the tank. Mm -hmm. I'm also, this is a big part of why they do uh, the bare bottoms, mm -hmm. is to keep all that stuff, when I put the heavy in, keep it suspended where the animals can actually get it rather than just rotten behind the rock and turning it into nitrate and phosphate. Yeah. Let's keep all those organics in the water where you can capture it, and then the stuff that they don't eat let's get it out of the tank so it doesn't turn into long-term pollution, algae and, slimes. And the only reason they need to get the stuff that isn't eaten out of the tank is because they're doing this every hour. If you're only feeding once or twice or even three times a day, you don't even have to do that because it's gonna still turn to nitrates and phosphates. And if you're only feeding once or twice a day, it's not gonna be so excessive that your nutrient levels are gonna go off the rail and you're gonna grow tons of, of algae. All right. Next one here is, uh, uh, this is an interesting I one. cringe every time you start a new one. <laughs> uh, next one here is, this is probably the most poorly understood thing out there. It took a long time for me to actually grasp it. Once you grasp it though, it's like, oh, the math on this is pretty simple. Okay, balling part C, which is the sodium chloride free salt, uh, is needed with two part additions and is not a magnesium supplement, I'm gonna add in here, is not a trace element supplement either. Uh, it's just part of the balling method. So uh, I finally <coughs> understand this. Go ahead and explain why. I might add a couple of things. So 
I guess there's a few things I want to say about this. The first thing is a lot of hobbyists are under the impression that if they're doing a two part, some type of calcium, some type of alkalinity, and they add some magnesium addition to that, that that's the balling method. That is not the balling method. So the balling method is a part A, which is the calcium chloride, a part B, which is mostly sodium bicarbonate, but has a little tiny bit of sodium carbonate in it. Um, and that's pretty similar to every two part that's out there, right? Mm -hmm. What the balling method does that's different is that it adds the part C. And part C is sodium chloride free sea salt, also by the way, has no calcium uh, and, and no alkalinity in it, right? Why do you need that? Well, the reason you need it is because the byproduct of adding the part A and B, the, the calcium chloride and the sodium bicarbonate, your animals are gonna use the calcium from the calcium chloride and they're gonna use the carbonate from the sodium bicarbonate. That leaves you there's nothing you can do about the fact where if you start with calcium chloride and you use the calcium, you're left with the chloride. If you start with sodium bicarbonate and you use the carbonate, you're left with the sodium. There's nothing you can do about that chemically. So you're left with that from that part A and B addition, you're left with sodium chloride. Sodium chloride is salt. Salinity's rising. Salinity's going up. Salinity goes up also with the balling method, but here's the difference. If you're doing just the two part, it's like taking a scoop of sodium chloride and putting it in your tank every day. Mm -hmm. What happens is the salinity is going up and what are you gonna do? You're gonna bring that salinity back down by adding some additional makeup water, the some only, fresh water. The only way you can get salinity down <clears throat> is remove some fresh water and replace it. Uh, remove some salt water. Or remove salt, salt water and replace it with fresh water. Some of you might be doing that like kind of anecdotally with your skimmer, uh, but you might be doing it intentionally. I, I walked up and it's 37 parts per million. I need to get to 35. I have to remove salt water and add fresh. Or you're doing it in your water changes or you're doing it inadvertently in your top off water. But either way, the addition of the two part in time is going to raise your salinity by the addition of sodium chloride. The reason it's a problem is because if I add sodium, if I take my perfectly <coughs> 35 <coughs> uh, you know, tank or my, my 1.026 tank <coughs> and I add sodium chloride to it and it goes up, <clears throat> and I take some salt water out and I add fresh water to it, I've brought my salinity, <clears throat> excuse me, I brought my salinity back down to 1.026, but I diluted everything else as well. So now I've got the right salinity with more sodium chloride and less of everything else. Okay, I'm gonna repeat this just so you track with it because this is like a super really common, really misunderstood thing. Yeah. I've got <clears throat> perfect parameters. This is 35 parts per million, whatever. Perfect parameters, <clears throat> cobalt's right. All the other stuff you can't test for is right, let's say. Okay, but it's now at 37. I take out the water and replace it with fresh water. What I've done is taken out cobalt, threw it down the drain. Taken out calcium, taken out sodium chloride, threw it down the drain. So when I diluted it, all levels dropped. Now you'll go test your calcium and alkalinity and correct for that because you have a test kit, right? Yeah. Uh, you'll correct your magnesium or whatever, but all the other stuff was just depleted. Now where this is like a problem, because it will not be a problem in month one. Right. 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 Like <clears throat> almost every problem that you will run into is the result of a decision that you've been making for two years. like. This problem, every single time you do this, gets a little bit worse every single time, right? And you're, if you're not doing ICP testing, well, the solution for me and the recommendation I give most people is once a year, string a handful of water, larger water changes together and you'll probably solve this problem. Or I can just in, address it intelligently, which is part C is box of salt essentially, without the calcium and alkalinity, because they know you're going to correct that already yeah. uh, afterward. <clears throat> uh, and it's just part C, so it accounts for this, so that on a long enough timeline, none of this ever happens. 
Yeah, and and so uh, another way to think about it is is this: if if you've got 1.026 on this line here, you've got 70 percent uh, sodium chloride and 30 percent other stuff. If you raise the sodium chloride, your salinity is now high. So if you take salt water out and you dilute it, you're bringing both of these things down. Now you've got the right amount of sodium chloride, but you've got less of all those trace elements. What Balling method does is the part C adds that sodium chloride, but also adds all of the other components of natural seawater. So now when your salinity is up, it's up in a way where everything is up, not just sodium chloride. So when you dilute it now, you're diluting everything back to where it started at 1.025 or 26. That's the beauty of the balling method. Now here's the real catch. People sometimes think, well, I'm doing two part and I'm adding magnesium, so I'm adding magnesium as well, so I'm okay. You're actually worse off because now in addition to adding the sodium chloride that's raising your salinity, you're also adding magnesium that's raising salinity. So you're pushing the other 30% of components, the other, well, it's not 30%, you can take out the magnesium. You're pushing all of those 70 trace elements down even further by that magnesium addition. So I'm not saying don't supplement for magnesium. I'm just saying that you need to keep everything equal so that when you do dilute it, because with the balling method, the, the salinity still goes up, but when you dilute it, you're diluting it in an ionically balanced way. Everything is there, so that when you dilute it, you're diluting everything. Okay, so what comes to mind to me is like, everybody's like, what's the best two part? Because they're all like calcium chloride and sodium <clears throat> carbonate, bicarbonate, or whatever, right? And like some mix of trace elements or whatever in there, but like they're all pretty much the same with some exceptions. Like, for instance, in this case, this one takes a known problem and solves it. And the reason, I'll be frank, that it isn't like widely used because it should be like it shouldn't be like it should be like number one, right? Because it's also inexpensive. Like it's one of mm -hmm. the more inexpensive ways to do this. Uh, so like, it's not like asking, you're probably going to go down in price uh, by switching this, especially because you've helped us develop a hybrid method mm -hmm. where people use BRS bulk chems and then you use the C with it and even the A and K for trace elements. Yeah. And like now what you have is this really inexpensive way for the calcium chloride, sodium carbonate, but you can do it correct. So this is one of the cheapest ways to do it. And it addresses a known chemistry issue. And so if we're talking like what's best, it addresses the known chemistry issues, especially the long term ones. I don't yeah. know how you define it any other way. There's no silver bullet for the calcium alkalinity addition thing. There's a lot of different ways to do it. The balling method is a great way to do it if you have some inconsistency in the amount of calcium and the amount of alkalinity that the tank is consuming. If the tank is consuming equal amounts of calcium and alkalinity, there are other ways that are, that are easier, I think, to do this. But the thing the balling method gives you that none of those other methods give you is this ability to adjust, oh, I need a little bit more alkalinity or I need a little bit more calcium. Usually it's the alkalinity that you, that you need. Um, the, the other thing that, I'm, that I just want to mention, and this we're not going to be able to drill down completely into this one because this is one nobody ever understands. I spent hours on the phone with people on this, but we should just mention it. When you're talking about balling C, you're talking about sodium chloride free sea salt that also doesn't have calcium and, and magnesium in it um, and, al and alkalinity. Uh, sorry, it's got magnesium, no calcium and alkalinity. And it's got all 70 trace elements in it. So naturally, people feel like the balling method is supplementing trace elements. I felt that way. It, uh, yeah. Now, no, it's not true. <laughs> it, it's not. So I'm going to make a distinction here between supplementation and addition, okay? And here's the distinction. The Balling Method Part C does add trace elements. There's no question, there's trace elements in it, there's 70 trace elements. When you put in your tank, you're adding trace elements to your tank. It is not, however, supplementation. Supplementation is making up for the used trace elements, the consumed trace elements, and so, you're, with the Part C, you're adding just enough to equalize that excess sodium chloride. You're not adding enough to
to make up for the used trace elements. Let me take a stab at this. All yeah. Right? You just scooped out some trace elements in a glass that you're gonna like to dilute your uh, uh, your tank from 37 to 35, scooped out some salt water. You're gonna pour those trace elements down the drain. Part C is only going to replace as much as you poured down the drain. That's why it's not supplementing anything. I'm just replacing what yeah. I just put in the trash essentially. Yeah, good, excellent, all right. So then the question becomes, the next question, which is I'm always asked after that is, well, can I just add more C as a trace element supplement? Mm. And the answer to that is no. It sounds like a good idea, but it's not. And the reason it's not is because when you're supplementing trace elements, you don't want to supplement all 70 trace elements. You want to supplement the, what, 15 or 20 that get used by the corals. And if you're supplementing all 70, you're supplementing a lot of trace elements that are not being used. So now you're adding extra trace elements. So for supplementation now, you wanna do your trace element addition separately for just those 15 or 20 that get used. And there are ways to do that within, you can add those trace elements directly to the balling method so that when you're putting in your three solutions to the balling method, you're doing your calcium, your alkalinity, and your trace elements. You still have to do your magnesium separately. Okay. So you're gonna hate part half of this conversation, but I'm gonna give it anyway. <laughs> okay, if I'm gonna pick a, a two part at this point for my tank, uh, I'm gonna pick it not based on packaging. I'm not gonna pick it on what my brother uses. Uh, I don't have a brother, but uh, I'm not gonna <laughs> use it. Uh, I just like uh, what for four people I don't even know in a forum use. Like I, I'm not gonna do that. I'm gonna go out because they're all you know essentially the same thing inside these things. This one solves a known chemistry issue, right? So, and it's also not like asking for a ton of money out of me or anything. It's like, I'm not like doubling my cost. In fact, in many cases, you might cut it in half. So win-win, mm -hmm. right? I'd use this because it solves a known problem for me, which makes it better than other things. With one exception, okay? If I ran a refugium, I'd probably use uh, Triton's Core 7 two-part mm -hmm. because they solve a known problem, which is, I got a ton of algae growing in the back now and it's sucking up all the molybdenum and the iron and manganese and mm -hmm. all this other stuff. Okay, so known problem. Now, most of the world uh, isn't running a refugium for some reason. Uh, so in that case, balling for me, but like when you're out there picking out a, a two part, like get past the packaging and say, what actually makes one of these things different? Is it worth the cost? Or do I actually get it better and cheaper at the same time, which is like the, you know, like more, better, less trifecta. Yeah, and then we can kind of wrap this whole thing up by also kind of reminding, <laughs> reminding everybody that balling is really, I think, the best solution when you've got this inequity between your calcium and your alkalinity consumption. If those, if that calcium and alkalinity, if you're, if you're adding part, uh, a two part, and you're always adding 54 mls every single day of both and you're staying rock solid on both your calcium and alkalinity i got i get easier better ways to do it okay we're just gonna i'm gonna let this deviate because it, we might as well just jump into all for reef okay because right? okay? <laughs> i actually had this debate uh with both uh thomas mm -hmm. and matthew both Thomas and Matthew are huge fans of all for reef. And so when we were talking about some of the best solutions of the year and some other videos we're shooting, uh, I, I'm like, Hey dude, I recommend two part. And they're like, no, I recommend all for reef. And then we had some debate. So I'm going to let you say why you like this all for reef. And I'm going to tell you for me, why I'm still a two part person. Uh, I, I mean, it's simple for me. Uh, it's, it's not real expensive. Mm -hmm. By the time you add up all of the calcium, alkalinity, magnesium, and trace element addition that you have to do, if you add all that up and then you look at the cost of all for reef, it's just not. Okay. Actually, pause for anybody who isn't uh, up to speed yet. Uh, all for reef is a one part. It's calcium formate. Uh, it ionizes in the water. Calcium adds calcium. The formate is processed by bacteria into carbonate alkalinity. Uh, so it's one of the very few options where you can put you know, both of these things in with one single solution also has some uh, trace elements in it, right? Uh, it's inexpensive, one dosing pump, which means automation yeah. is cheaper. 
Like it is a very, very attractive solution. Also no sodium chloride. Right. So salinity no problem salinity. is out the door too. Okay, so. So you just said everything I was gonna say about why I think Alpha Reef oh, is I a good solution. I don't pay you much to say all that. I sold, <laughs> I stole all your thunder. Okay, so all that's true, I acknowledge it, Yeah. right? Okay, and uh, when Olfrey first came out, we were kind of like pitching it as a option for low to medium demand tanks, garbage. I've yeah, seen everybody's it Everybody's using it on, yeah. that's why we had to come out with that 1400 gram yeah. big powder because everybody's using it on big, big systems. Zach had a tank here that was just top to bottom SPS, yeah, man. Yeah. It, was, it was switched over from two part to this, no problem. It was like, kind of like one of the test tanks. So wait, us. I want to hear your, uh, okay. This is why I like two part better. And there, you have your bid about they're separate and if you had slightly different consumption. Yeah, yeah. Right? The reason is because most of the people that are asking me this question uh, are not as advanced as you and me, right? And the problem with uh, the calcium formate is I can't test for it right away. Mm -hmm. So like calcium, a two part, I can dump it in, use a calculator uh, and I could test for it in 10 minutes and it'll be the number that I thought. I, yeah. go, I go to sleep now. The calcium formate, I actually have to wait for the alkalinity to be processed, like the formate to be processed by the uh, bacteria into the carbonate alkalinity, which I don't know how long it takes. Uh, but you know, it's like less than a day. Uh, it's different in different systems. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's just the the point is you you can't just dump it in like you can uh, sodium carbon or sodium bicarbonate and then do your do your test. You do your alkalinity test right then and there. Which means you need to be a little bit different skill set to use this because I, I have to really understand the mechanisms of what's happening here, and that even though I can't test for it, it might actually be in there still. Uh, and this isn't difficult. It's just that it's more difficult than dump two part in, test and know it's done. I'm gonna argue with you a little on this. Go, go for it, man. Um, because once you get over the transition stage, you are pretty much just testing your alkalinity. It's really just that first week where you gotta struggle a little bit with it. Uh, once you've got it dialed in, you're testing your alkalinity like you do for anything else. It's just not, the alkalinity you're testing is, is not the alkalinity that you just added, but maybe you, you do your addition, your, you got your dosers doing your addition during the day and you test your alkalinity at the same time every night or, or you test it you know once a week on the weekend or something. It really is no different. So the dial-in process is really what I'm talking about because as somebody who manned the phones here, like getting that dial-in process, like for your first or even second time is a real challenge. Uh, on two part. Even. Yeah. Uh, and so like getting a new person to do this, there's no way around it for me. The calcium formate is a little harder to understand. For you to really understand even what's happening here, you got to have a little bit more like background in science. You want me to give right? you the key to it? Hmm. I'll give you the key to it and make it easy. You can tell your technical people to tell people to do this. Okay. All right. Is there a calculator for this, by the way? If I used X, it would raise it Y? Uh, there, there is a calculator for the calcium part of it. I don't know if it has the, uh, the alkalinity part. So that's, that was the other reason, actually. Yeah, but here's the thing. You should be using the calcium to regulate the alpha reef, or this is true for carbocalcium too, by the way. Carbocalcium is just like alpha reef, but it's only the alkalinity and the calcium, no trace elements, no magnesium. So same thing, calcium formate. Um, you should be using, in my opinion, the calcium as the dosage regulator for the alpha reef and the carbocalcium, not the alkalinity. So in the transition, you're adding your alpha reef, you're testing your calcium. A few days later, you're gonna test your alkalinity, see where it is. If you were using equal parts in your two part, 99% of the time your alkalinity is gonna be fine. Okay, so the reason we do it inverse with two part is we test alkalinity is because alkalinity is a, is a precursor. Alkalinity goes up and down faster than calcium. And in fact, most people probably don't know this, but I think the right, the math is, if I took all of the alkalinity out of the tank, like it all got consumed, 100% of it, calcium only drops 20 parts per million. Uh -huh. uh, there's that much more uh, calcium than alkalinity. So if I'm testing calcium uh, for the calcium formate, the window isn't as precise, right? Yeah. And so I'm nitpicking here. There's no question about it. Uh, but like, 
when people ask me and I ask, they're looking for what I think is going to send them on the highest success paths. That's it. Now there's a bunch of people that are watching though. They're like, no, I mean, I got all this dude. I understand it's turning into alkalinity. And after a couple of days, I'll figure it out, which is probably most of the people watching this right mm -hmm. now. Well, no harm, no foul, man. That is a great option. And, it, and there's a reason why now between you and Matthew and, <laughs> and uh, Thomas, I'm on the wrong side of this. Well, not, you're not on the wrong side, but I'm going to give you yet one more reason mm -hmm. why al Farif, and, and you're going to understand this because you're a marketing guy. So you're going to understand this. Most of the people, ah, I'm not going to say most, a lot of the people that are using two-part are not doing the proper or the needed trace element addition along with it. A lot of the people, I know a lot of people that do, you know, great two part, test everything, whatever. They're, they're, not, they're not into the trace element part of it. The thing the all Farif gives you is that automatic trace element regulation. And I get so many calls from people, so many calls that say, oh, I started using all Farif my corals all of a sudden turn a the corner. They look amazing. They're growing like they never were. You know, like this, it's a really fantastic product. It's, you know, I wish I had this before, blah, blah, blah. And I try to get them to understand it, it probably isn't the calcium alkalinity part of the all for reef that's making the difference. I ask those people, were you doing trace elements before? Most of the time, the answer is no. And it's that trace, that automatic, you're doing one solution, you're getting your calcium, alkalinity, trace element, and magnesium, and it's one solution where you're getting all of that. And uh, so many people avoid that trace element addition as well, and then all of a sudden when they're getting it, they see that difference in their corals. I'm gonna add one more change. <laughs> okay, I, I love the debate here. Because uh, in here, somebody's gonna hear the right thing for them, whatever yeah. it might be. Okay. So uh, the other part is the pH benefit. Yeah. Now, if you're talking typical balling method versus this, it's about the same. They're both not going to increase the pH mm -hmm. to, uh, to any meaningful degree. Okay. If you do the Tropic Marine BRS hybrid uh, balling method, which would be using soda ash instead of uh, using sodium bicarbonate, mm -hmm. now the pH goes up. Now, this is a ridiculously common problem in reefing and like, I haven't figured out the solution or I think I'd become painting for this a little harder, but like in our hobby, we have come to the conclusion that, you know, somewhere between 7.8 and 8.3 is okay. But really what that sentence means is 7.8, it's still surviving. Mm -hmm. Like it's not doing well, man. It's surviving. In right? some tanks. I know well, some tanks that run at 7.8 that look fantastic. Would they look better at 8.2? Probably, I'm but gonna who knows? Go, I'm gonna, I do know. I do. Uh, because I've done the research on this, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, and I've done the experiments. So the research on this is in the ocean, man, we call it ocean acidification. Mm -hmm. If it goes yeah. below uh, uh, 8.3 to 8.2 or even below. And they can measure the waves of mortalities that happen on the reefs when it goes down a single tenth of a point. Mm -hmm. man. Uh, because the corals are no longer able to get rid of that hydrogen. They build up acidity inside of uh, their tissue and it kills them. Right. Or at least make some more uh, stress and they grow way slower and their skeleton is all brittle and full of little holes. Yeah. So it happens in nature. Yeah. We did experiments here and we ran the tanks at different pHs and the tanks grew way faster. I mean, we're, I think one of them, I think one of the groups of the ABs grew 70 percent faster wow. at 8.3. And that was exponential. So meaning inside of 90 days. So uh, it grows 70 percent, then 70 on the 70 and the 70. And this is you know, part of the reason why you see some people who have tanks that took them five years to fill out. And some people did this miraculously in 18 months. Mm -hmm. You know, what were the differences? Here? Yeah. OK, so now if you don't have a pH issue in your tank and now there are other ways to solve pH that isn't related to chemicals yeah, that's like, where I was like two part. Yeah. Or I mean, or like uh, refugiums yeah. and uh, the CO2 scrubbers and stuff like that in the world. Yeah. So, but like, that is where I make these intelligent decisions. Uh, how do I pick the right solution, the right tool for the job? Not independently. It's not what is the right two part. It's what else is going on in this tank because I have to manage all these things together. Yeah, I'm not against uh, uh, the, the sodium carbonate method. <clears throat> 
I do always, and, and people that have talked to me about this pH thing in their tank know that this is my approach. I like to get the tank running at 8.0 to 8.2 on its own. Mm -hmm. And I'm a firm believer that most reef tanks want to be there because there's so much, uh, there's so much um, uh, calcium carbonate in these reef tanks that they want to be at 8.0 to 8.2. So if your system is running under that, we need to look at why that might be the case. 95% of the cases is because we're breathing in the house. Yes. Uh, and yep. so what's really lowering the pH in, in the ocean is the buildup of carbon dioxide in our atmosphere. Yep. Uh, and it's it decreasing the pH of the ocean. In our houses, like when we go outside, we're, that carbon dioxide is from all the machinery and uh, people breathing and whatever. Uh, it's being diluted across the whole, whole earth. When I got five people and a cat and a dog living in my little house, man, and I can tell you that because if you watch the pH in this facility, man, on the weekdays, it's so hard to keep it above 7.8. Mm -hmm. On the weekends when nobody's here, man, it shoots all the way back up to 8.3. Yeah. But like, it's Minnesota, what am I gonna do? Leave the windows open all the time? So yeah. it's, I always tell people it's three things. It comes down, if their pH is running low in your tank, it's probably one of three things. Circulation, aeration or CO2 pooling. It's one of those three things. And I would say maybe 75% of the time that I get a call about low pH, I can usually help people figure out. There are plenty of times when I can figure it out, but usually we can figure out what is the cause of that pH sink and, and help them get that, that tank up to 80. Most of the time you can just tell people, go open your windows for three hours and watch the pH. Yeah. If opening the window solved the problem, there it is. Yeah. Uh, if it didn't, go hunting for other stuff. Take an airline, hook it to your protein skimmer, run it out the window. All right, man. Uh, number nine here, which is uh, uh, magnesium, is it as important for calcium as calcium for calcification to happen? I didn't know this. So. Yeah. The, there's a there's a reason that there's about about three times as much magnesium in the ocean as there is calcium. There's a reason that, every, look at every calcium supplement for humans on the market. Any pill that's a calcium supplement for humans, it's got three times as much magnesium in it. There's a three to one ratio that those corals need for active calcification. I know so many people that call me and we talk about their tanks running and they ask about calcification and I ask them what their calcium level is. They know exactly down to the point what their calcium level is. And then I ask them what's their magnesium level and they say, oh, I never test for magnesium. Mm -hmm. Magnesium in the ocean, around 1290. I like to run a reef tank 13 to 1400. The other point about magnesium is that low magnesium is much more detrimental for your system than high magnesium is. So if you run up to 1500, even 1550 or close to 1600, it's not dangerous. It's not optimum, but it's, it's fine. But if you're running down 1100 or, or, or less, let's say, you're, let's say you're running 900 in your magnesium level in your system. Divide that nine by three, that's 300. So that means that if your corals, even if you've got a calcium level of 450 in your tank, those corals are only able to use about 300 ppm because there's only 900 magnesium. So you really need to maintain that magnesium level up. So this is interesting. So I know most people who have been watching us know full well the, like the science of how the magnesium kind of poisons the surface of the crystal, calcium carbonate crystals, or, like, or not poisons it, uh, that it is uh, pre present preventing the calcium and alkalinity from finding each other, right? Uh, and it's why we're able to maintain soluble calcium and alkalinity is because it kind of prevents this from forming and staying that way. Okay. I have heard many times, though, that like things like the magnesium and the strontium and stuff like that helps form the right ar aragonite crystal, mm -hmm. right? So it's not just calcium carbonate. It's a little bit more complex than that. Mm -hmm. it creates this aragonite crystal that is stronger and less brittle and uh, grows faster. Now, I haven't like seen, you know, overwhelming science, 
but it doesn't matter because I was going to maintain the 1350 regardless to make sure that I can maintain soluble calcium and alkalinity. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The, the flyer in there is that strontium one. Uh, I, there's so many people that have sworn to me that if they use strontium, that uh, their coralline algae takes off, right? This is a calcifying algae. Yeah. Uh, and that's another one that actually related to the pH. For me and tanks that I maintain that 8.3, the, the coralline algae is a problem. It grows so fast. Yeah. The people that don't maintain it at 7.8, it actually just dissolves. Uh, and so, for instance, in my own tank at uh, uh, the 360, at my house, uh, and when, when the tank was there, Coraline Elegy Man was just covering every available surface in that entire tank. It was dark, dark, dark purple everywhere. Move it to this facility where pH is a problem and the Coraline Elegy is getting dissolved. Really? Yeah. Uh, wow. it, it is a remarkable thing. So wow. it is, I think the... And I've been part of it. In the past, I have said, don't worry about pH. Don't chase pH because it's probably... Oh, to a point you have to. You're probably going to screw things up more than you're yeah. going to help. I think the knowledge level in this hobby has gotten to the point where, no, man, there's solutions to this. Let's just go use them. They don't have to be chemicals. They can yeah. be growing algae in your sump. It can be uh, scrubbing it out of the uh, interaction with the skimmer and the CO2 media. Yeah, CO2 scrubbers are working. Pumping awesome. a tube outside to, to pull from uh, your skimmer from outside instead of inside. In fact, some people probably don't know this, but the skimmer is actually likely lowering the pH, not increasing it. So the knee jerk is like better aeration, mm -hmm. right? Is going to like get rid of the carbon dioxide out of the water. But if the concentration in the atmosphere of your house is higher than the tank, the skimmer's actually gonna mix it in faster. Yeah, yeah. So if you wanna know that is happening to you, go unplug your skimmer and watch the pH and find out. Uh, because it's not all good. Now, obviously it's interjecting uh, oxygen and other good things that are happening there, but it's a little bit more complex than that. So that was interesting from the magnesium bit. Yeah, and, and um, proof of the pudding is, like I said, look at the human you look at the human calcium supplements. You see three times as much magnesium in every single one of them. Interesting. All right, this one we're gonna we're gonna maybe have to. Fight. Are we at number ten now? No. Uh, oh yeah, number ten. <laughs> uh, we're gonna have to fight about this one. Corals don't live in a sterile environment. Only run UV and activated carbon when needed. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm a firm believer in this one. Um, and I'm happy to argue this with you. It is a debatable topic. So activated carbon strips a lot of good stuff out of the water. And um, the one thing that activated carbon does really well that I love is if your water's looking yellow, you run a little activated carbon, clear it up in no time. Mm -hmm. um, so I like to see people plumb a, um, a, you know, a, a canister filter into their systems. So that if you ever do need to run activated carbon, boom, put it in there, done. The other thing I like to see people plumb into their systems when they're designing them is a good, strong UV unit that's sized properly to the size of the system. The reason for that is that if you get a bacterial bloom, really the only way you're gonna get rid of it is with UV. Or a lot of time. Yeah, and with time, it's hard even. I mean, it's a lot of time. and Or it could be gone like that. Well, and in the meantime, you're, you're, you're killing your fish and your corals with low oxygen levels during that, during that bacterial bloom. If you've got a good UV unit plumbed in your system, you turn it on, it's gone in a few hours. And overnight, it's gone. It's clean. The problem with running UV and carbon 24-7 is that... Number one, you're sterilizing the water, you're killing everything that you can in the water column, and you're stripping a bunch of extremely valuable nutrients out of the water column. So my approach, which I can see is not yours, I'm waiting, um, but my approach is have them ready to go, so when you need them, they're there, but don't run them 24 seven. Let your corals take those nutrients out of the water let the living stuff that's in the water column feed your corals. Don't kill it with your UV. And then when you need it, you can use it. Okay, so this is the, the problem that I've run into now. And this is, you know, you gotta, you gotta pick what is most important to you, right? Okay, so 
I guess I've just figured out that you should just assume all fish you buy are sick now. Mm -hmm. Like I, you've seen the facilities, like the way that they come in, the where they're held together. I, I, you should just assume that they have something. Well, right? they've traveled also. Just the traveling yeah. itself is going to. But it's like up. you took everybody traveling and then you made them all stay in the same room together for, you know, the next week. Uh, and they're not wearing masks. Yeah, <laughs> really. I, it's, I, I've just come to that conclusion. Now, I've also come to the conclusion that just because it, when I put it in there and it doesn't go bad, that it wasn't sick. Yeah. Because I've seen plenty of instances where the heater breaks and the water gets cold, the ick breaks out, mm -hmm. or even the velvet breaks out and takes over the whole tank. And all it takes is one fish to be susceptible to become the breeding ground for this yeah. thing. And then it just explodes out through the whole tank and you've lost all your pets. Yeah. Okay. So... Uh, for me, I have now run many, many tanks using properly sized UV, meaning it's, it's designed the same way a commercial application would mm -hmm. use it, not a hobbyist mm -hmm. uh, toy, you know? And I think those toys that were sold to our hobby was the worst possible thing that ever happened to UV because they do not work. They could yeah. not possibly do anything. Big, giant waste of money. Okay. But I, this tank right here, uh, Elliot, like, just laughed at me that because this tank has a powder blue in it mm -hmm. right and this tank has ick for sure 100 percent, right and it is not breaking out right and it was breaking out until we put the uv on mm -hmm. and so this is one of the conversations where people will tell you that uv can't actually solve an outbreak not true actually it, it won't solve it. If it's outbreaking, like everything's going to die in the next few days, well, everything's going to die in the next few days. But if you're seeing it show up on the fish, basically what we're doing is we're processing all of that water mm -hmm. in there, you know, like every few, a few times, every hour. Yeah. Right? And so it's not about making sure that it isn't going to take over your tank. It's about population control. Mm -hmm. It's like there's so few that it never breaks out. Like even though patient zero being the uh, 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 powder blue has it, it won't go to all the other fish. And now the powder blue doesn't even have it either. Right. Right. I've seen this so many times now in so many tanks that like for me, protecting the fish, the sentient being uh, in there uh, is paramount. And uh, all the tanks that I run it on, the corals are just doing just fine too. So theoretically, I understand like the sterile environment yeah, yeah. conversation. Theoretically, that is the UV damaging some of the organics? Theoretically, sure. But in the reality, the fish are living. Uh, and here's the bit is like, well, right now everybody's chiming in and saying, well, you should go do QT, QT. Yeah, like, yeah. oh yeah, I was on I, board with that. I'm, I'm thinking you're making a great case for QT. Okay, yeah. So you know what QT looks like? Every single last fish that goes in there has to go through a three week medicated QT. Like you, you can't watch it. You have to assume it has everything yeah, yeah. and then go put it through the whole thing, right? Every last fish. All right, not so hard. Uh, uh, somebody shows you how to do it. But now every last snail, every last crab, every last coral, every last drop of water that goes in the tank also has to go through that process. And the tank can't be within 10 feet of anything else because the small little bits of ick can attach itself to the mist and travel 10 <laughs> feet, man, to the other tank. So for me, the reality is, is uh, like a 99% of the people watching this, they're never gonna do all that stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And so for me, uh, don't care about all the other things because I've run UV and all of these other things and it hasn't killed all my corals. Mm -hmm. I do believe there's probably something to the conversation about when you turn it on. Yeah, yeah. Because the tank needs to actually spread the bacteria mm -hmm. and archaea around the tank. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know the answer to that question yet. There's probably some answer to the perfect time to turn it on. The perfect time for the fish might be day one. Right. Uh, the perfect time for everything else might not be. Yeah, I won't. I won't argue with that. I'm not going to argue that point with you. I will say, um, you know, you made you made a statement where you run it on your tanks and your corals look fine. We go back to that. Is that a five fine or an eight fine or a ten fine? We don't you, know. You saw the seven. Yeah, I know. It looks beautiful. Okay, it looks yeah. beautiful. Um, but I just think that um, maybe we could come to a compromise and we could say you plumb it in. You use it sometimes when you need it, but let the let the 
the, the bio load and the biology of the water not be totally sterile. I'm not coming along for the ride in this one. UV for me, right. it's it's an ounce of prevention that solves the pound. Well, we of agree on so much, it's okay to disagree. Boom, there it is. <laughs> All right, so you said you had to have 11, man. Yeah, uh, you know me, I've always got one other thing to say. Past 10. All right, so I had to have number 11. Average 10% or 20% water, uh, water changes don't replenish anything. So replenish meaning I'm going to add trace elements back into the water. And it's not about taking it out. It doesn't replenish anything. Yeah, so many people say, oh, yeah, uh, water changes are awesome at getting rid of stuff. You know, you got a high phosphate level. You do a 30% water change. You just got rid of 30% of your phosphates. That's mm -hmm. pretty good, mm -hmm. right? But if you have a low level of something and you do a 30% water change, now you're only adding... 30% of what you need on the one day you do your water change. Uh, most people do a 10, 15, 20% water change. If you have trace element depletion and you do a 20% water change once a month, you're replenishing 20% of your consumed trace elements once a month. It's just not enough. And, and I again, so many people on these forums say, you know, oh, I maintain the tank just with water changes and it does great. Well, my answer to that is if your tank is doing great with just 20% water changes once a month, and it's a, it's a reef tank, right? I'm not talking about fish only here. Um, then I don't think you have a good handle on what the tank doing great is because it should be consuming more than that. I mean, I have people that even say this in relation to calcium and alkalinity. And if you're replenishing what you need in calcium and alkalinity in a reef tank with a 20% water change once a month, your tank is not doing what it can do. So my point there is I'm a huge fan of water changes. I'm not one of these people that says you need to do a 20% water change every two weeks. No, I'm fine with doing a 10 or a 20% water change every two months if that works in your system. Every three months. I just don't think you should go forever without a water change. I think that Introducing new fresh compounds is a good idea. I think it's like giving your animals a breath of fresh air when you do a water change. I know uh, I don't have a reef anymore, but I know when I kept my reef, 100% of the time that I did a water change, my animals looked better the next day. Absolutely true. 100% of the time. Can I tell you exactly why? No, but they always did. And in my book, if there's a button that I can push on my reef tank to make my animals look better the next day, I probably should push the button once in a while. I, mean, I hate to say it this way, but this is like a closed zoo environment where there's a whole lot of food and poo going in and there's no real method for it to actually get out. So uh, like if you were living in here in this room with me for the next month, uh, I'd be happy if they did a room change yeah. as well. Yes. But uh, don't think you're replenishing a whole lot of stuff that you need with a 20% water change. So the reason for the replenishment thing is like versus dilution is because if I'm going to do a dilution, uh, you know, I say I had a hundred parts per million nitrate or whatever, and I did a 20% water change. Well, I'm diluting it with zero, right? And so now it's going to go down to about 80, right? If I was going to do the trace element thing in reverse, like, Let's say I had a trace element of 100, right? And it dropped to 80, and then I did a 20% water change with 100. It only up, went up a couple of points. Yeah. Because it's not like like overpowering at the same time. It point. went up to 88. Yeah. If, you, if you did your water your your uh, water change with 100, oh, it would only go 20 to, It would only 20%, though. It would uh, only be 20% of, it, it barely goes up. Yeah. And it's a seesaw that just keeps getting worse. Now, I got to tell you, though, like I buy into this wholeheartedly. And I also buy wholeheartedly into the fact that these trace elements that are being consumed are regulating some kind of biological function within that coral or the zooxanthellae. Mm -hmm. uh, like I, you couldn't convince me otherwise. I couldn't tell you exactly what they're doing, but I got news for you. We can't tell you what vitamin A, K, and D, and all those things, the exact methodology that's happening in the human body either. Yeah, right. right. We know the net outcome in some of these cases. Uh, you had to take the vitamin D, you're probably gonna be healthier, right? Yeah. Okay, uh, you know, the A, your eyes won't go, you know? It, like we don't know all we can do it. We also will never know about the coral. Right. But we do know that these photosynthetic organisms being the zooxanthellae and the animal, the coral are consuming these things to assume that we don't need to replenish them 
is more about us just not wanting to do it than common sense for caring for an animal, yeah. right? So that said, this is just one of those weird conundrums for me. And this might hit the, like, you can't tell the difference between a five tank and a mm -hmm. 10 tank. I've seen so many tanks, dude, that have like just managed calcium chloride and uh, sodium carbonate or bicarbonate, yeah. and then do done their water changes and the tanks look awesome. Now, this again could be the difference between, I didn't actually follow the journey for that tank from month one to month 48. You right. know, I might've just caught it in month 18. Uh, and uh, some of those people might also be listening to the council that once a year at least, or twice a year, string together some really big water changes mm -hmm. to get it back up to some normal level. Uh, and, you know, some of them may periodically use different levels of trace elements. Now, there is only one that I just wouldn't use, right? The trace element. Like you, you see trace, trace elements mixed into the two part. Yeah. You see it mixed into the one part. You see it uh, with the A and K where I can choose to just add it into yeah. the two part. Uh, I wouldn't use the one that's just trace element elixir deluxe. No. Because I don't know how much to use, man. Yeah. Uh, like I just don't. It's You're way more likely to screw this up. And those trace elements are way more likely to become poisons uh, at higher levels than actually being depleted in some cases. Yeah, I think the, the proof of the pudding for me is, I mean, I think you're right. I think that there are certain tanks that do very well with, without a specific trace element addition. Could they be doing better if they had trace elements? I don't know. I'm going to say I, I probably think they would be doing better. Um, but the proof of the pudding of me is, for me is so many people say to me, once they start adding trace elements, they see that difference in their corals. So there's clearly something there that when you're not adding trace elements, there's some kind of deficit there that you're not making up for, that when you start adding those trace elements, that deficit is made up for, and all of a sudden the corals start looking really different. Okay, you know what? Like, this actually comes into the other bit is, so can you tell the difference between a five and a 10, right? Well, I most people would not be able to just visually say that coral is a 10 healthy, yeah, yeah. right? Okay, also, corals just die, right? Yeah. Okay, so all of a sudden out of nowhere, this coral that was magically doing great for the last three years just kicks the bucket and dies. Yeah, right? it happens. Okay, so what's been wrong about this hobby is we take the mentality of, eh, Whatever I was doing is still fine though. You know, no, I'm, I'm nailing this, man. Stuff is dying, man. <laughs> <laughs> like, uh, okay, once in a while, I don't know, man. But like, I've even heard people say like, there's evil in the tank. The reason the coral died is because of the evil in the tank, which is just garbage. I don't listen that, to that person. I think that um, there's, a, there's a, a difference between the first year and then after that. Mm -hmm. So if, if I, if somebody's talking to me about a coral that dies during the first year, up to the one year point, could be any one of a zillion different things. And, and sometimes that's not 100% related to what they're doing, right? Then it doesn't mean they're doing something wrong, right? I'm not saying that they couldn't maybe have saved that coral, but it's not always necessarily something that they did wrong. But when you have a coral that lasts longer than a year, has been growing in your tank for three, four, five years, and then all of a sudden it croaks. Something's it, wrong. It didn't get something it needed. Your puppy doesn't just yeah, kick yeah. the bucket right. and roll over. Exactly. Man. Like, exactly. and this this isn't as a sensitive creature as you think. And so uh, it is. We, if it was as sensitive as we think, nobody would be able to do this. You know, it, like, it isn't. Oh, they're that way hard. tougher than we thought they were. Yeah. Okay. So if that coral that has been in there for two years just kicks the bucket, that means something is wrong in this tank right? And you just don't know what it is. Yeah. Could be the trace elements uh, that are not regulating biological function. It could be a toxin. It could be a whole lot of different things, man. But like the answer to eliminating that from the whole equation is doing this to the best of your ability. Now, I do understand, again, that like there's instances where doing it to the best of your ability just becomes so labor intensive mm -hmm. and so expensive. Uh, the quarantine thing, yeah. like, quarantining every last snail that goes in there. I, yes, that is the best possible way. Not going to do it. Uh, 
uh, it's like, and I've been doing this 20 years and I, I guarantee there's people looking at me right now saying, well, you should do that. I'm like, I just don't have that room yeah. in my life, man, to do that. I'm going to manage it in different methods. So uh, for us, I think we need to embrace the things like you say, the trace elements. It doesn't really even matter that we have been marginally successful or even good, well, like very successful. If we can do better and what better looks like is they're growing faster, they have healthier tissue, uh, they may even like spawn the tank. You saw the torch that spawned yeah, in my wild. tank today. Wow. Uh, you know, they may like replicating. Actually, I saw this one time, like if you think of the health, it's metabolic function energy goes to, uh, uh, and then it's growth, and mm -hmm. then finally like reproduction. Like there's no reason that we couldn't get these things to actually reproduce. Oh, I think thing. we, I think we're definitely headed in that direction. Yeah, so uh, it's the leg arts that are saying, just do it the crappy way of old. There's a better way to do it. All right, so if you wanna see more of Lou, actually we're gonna continue this series and you can find the playlist right here. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure.